Chip Model, we've heard from, um, from Hans about Novartis's intra-country price discrimination. And now I'm going to turn over the mic to uh, Prashant Idab, who is one of the most distinguished scholars in this space, has spent a lot of time thinking about these issues, and I um, would love to hear your reactions. Thank you, Quentin, and uh, thank you uh, for having me here at this uh, workshop. I think when we look at products which serve um, populations in developing countries, I think it's, it becomes important to segment into two types, and some would argue perhaps three. But I think having that distinction is important because if we are talking about pragmatic strategies, unless we, we look at that segmentation, our, our pragmatism, the strategies gets lost. So the segmentation I want you to start with is products which have a market in both high income, uh, a sizable market in middle income, and some market in low income, and products which have a vast majority of the market that only exists in low-income countries. Examples would be malaria drugs. So the kinds of strategies we can put in place will differ depending upon which we are looking at, and some will have an overlap, but I think um, unless we separate the two, we won't get a clearer picture. So let's first think about the, those, those products for which there is only a market or the, the burden of disease is largely in low-income countries. Malaria would be one example. Some middle but largely low-income countries. And I think there um, the question of sustainability is to be asked in a, in a very different way. And I think if we say sustainability means a firm does everything, then I think we are looking at the right, wrong model, primarily because even the cost of manufacturing, so even if you do not recoup any uh, research and development cost, even if you do not recoup anything else, just the sheer cost of manufacturing is something that cannot be met by the current paying population or, in, in some cases, even the government, which may pull. So their sustainability doesn't mean a firm doing it alone. Sustainability means ensuring that our institutions, such as the Global Fund, Gavi, uh, PEPFAR, PMI, and the interface they have with the firm is an area where some low-hanging fruit remains, where we can improve things, improve access in a dramatic way without having to do something um, very large-scale change. So we, ha we often uh, critique large global institutions just because uh, being a global institution comes with its set of bureaucracy, comes with its set of uh, constraints that public capital or philanthropic capital often leads to. But I think there are opportunities to change the way firms and the Global Fund or PEPFAR or PMI or, or other institutions like that work, and that can help serve the, this segment of the market, which is primarily uh, low-income countries. There are some opportunities of uh, using intra-country differential pricing in that market, like Hans was mentioning, uh, but I think even, um, even intra-country differential pricing alone cannot perhaps solve all of that issue. Then I think if we look at those products which have a dual market, which means those who have a significant middle income or um, even a higher income country market, there I think the value of intra-country differential pricing and intra-country differential pricing and some combination of the two becomes one of our most important tools. The idea is very simple. We believe we can recoup R&D costs, at the same time improve access, um, but for some reason, the simple theoretical idea does not translate into something which we can see being used on a wide scale in practice. And as an academic or, or someone who works at a think tank, I have had the opportunity of working with several companies who have been experimenting, uh, trying to do either inter, intra-country or some combination of inter- and intra-country differential pricing, and as a result have learned what their challenges are. And I think oftentimes in forums like this, we tend to think about what can we do at the inter-firm level, which means what can we do in the way a global institution works. But I think often, in this case, the challenges may even be intra-firm. Intra-firm incentives, and I'll, I'll get into the details of what exists within a firm that often is challenging. So if we look at um, inter-country differential pricing, I think a, a large part of it depends upon if you decrease price points in certain middle-income countries or low-income countries, the expectation is from a firm standpoint, volumes will increase. But that doesn't happen because the cascade of care and the bottlenecks that exist in the cascade of care are very many, whether it's diagnosis, uh, lack of treatment care provision, options, and so on. So then it becomes a question, can a firm 
work with partners to resolve each of the bottlenecks in the cascade of care and whose job is it? To what extent is it a firm's job? To what extent is it the job of the government of the country? And to what extent is it the job of some global institutions? And that's something which we've experimented with. We've not come up with one way of doing it, but I think that's an area where we've learned quite a lot more in the last decade than what we used to know in the early 2000s when um, many of these newer institutions were being created and new programs like uh, the malaria program at Novartis were being created. So I think we've, we've come a, a long way in, in that. Then I think if you look at intra-country differential pricing, and this is something I've uh, explored since 2007 and 8. Um, I, I went and asked, and, and some of you perhaps in this room, the question, as a company, do you engage in intra-country differential pricing? And a resounding answer I got from most companies I talked to was either no or very little. And it, it sort of baffled me that the Treaty of Westphalia, which was defining the concept of a nation state in 1856 perhaps, was not the only way to segment to do pricing, right? I mean, we didn't have to necessarily say the pricing segment will be a nation state, and for a nation state, this is the price. We could choose uh, pricing for market segments as we thought appropriate. So then the question was, why can't we do it? Why can't we say this is the wealthy people in Kenya, and these are the uh, less wealthy people in Kenya, and can we have separate price points? And the reasons were, well, there'll be product diversion. It'll flow across the channels, and whatever price we give to the low income will start uh, that product will start flowing. And so, yes, that's the reason I got more and more interested in this issue because my training is in supply chain management and looking at distribution channels. And we try to figure out what can be done in the distribution channel and how can we split some of the risks that fall entirely on the firm if it does intra-country differential pricing. So imagine, uh, and I'm going to use um, Novartis as an example just because I've, I've, I've been a friend of Hans for, for, for a while now. Uh, so I think the, the key thing is if all of the risk of a product that is meant to be sold to the more affordable segment moving into the high income falls on the firm and it is expected of the firm to make investments to reduce that diversion, then I think the equation doesn't work out well from a sustainability standpoint. If we say that the package that is going to the low income market is subsidized by the U.S. President's Malaria Initiative or the Global Fund, now, that package coming into a wealthy pharmacy in Nairobi suddenly becomes a risk, which is also for the large financier. And that sharing means both parties now have to exert effort to make sure that diversion doesn't happen. And oftentimes, a company has very little control in the country to prevent diversion, but a government or a global institution may have better ability to control that. So that's, that's an area I think we can experiment with and can learn some from uh, what the Novartis work is done. The second part we often forget, and this is what a very operational thing, is that the risk that falls on a company in such markets is larger than what it is in bigger markets. And the reasons are very many, but there are two that stand out. One is risk about demand uncertainty. Because the pair is more decoupled, the pair is always decoupled in, in a pharmaceutical health product market, but in this case, the pair is far more decoupled uh, from the company and from the end consumer because we are paying through a global mechanism. It becomes hard for a company to know what the demand will be to do planning. And every time you have poor demand um, certainty, that leads to increased prices because someone has to pay the cost of the millions of doses that have to be destroyed or expire, and occasionally one time the company may say we'll write it off, but eventually if this is a repeat occurrence, this is a cost that a public payer uh, or a government will have to bear. So that's the demand uncertainty part. The second is a credit risk element, which is when we look at small country governments purchasing, oftentimes for a, um, a company taking on the credit risk of whether they'll pay or at least whether they'll pay on time, um, and then once it's beyond 180 days, or 360 days, do you call it a written off uh, account or do you still consider that as account receivables and, and how do you manage that? So that's another area where we can do something because we have new forms of capital today. I think new kinds of philanthropic capital have become available which do not come with the kinds of constraints that public capital used to have. And we can very effectively use this new philanthropic capital to do risk underwriting which can then lead to a company being able to serve smaller markets much better. Then I think, um, if you look at 
inter, um, inter country differential pricing, one element that doesn't always work out is the current distributor for a, for a company, their incentive structures are, here is your target or your quota for the country. And if you achieve it, you remain a distributor, you achieve your bonus, that's how they incentivize the sales force. The challenge is most distributors, especially in countries where the company does not have a, an affiliate office, are people who've been the distributors for more than a decade. And they have become complacent. I'm, I'm being very candid here, uh, <laughs> acknowledging that this is being uh, live streamed. Most of them have become complacent because they serve the capital city and the 25 or 50 tertiary care establishments that exist in the capital city and they meet their quota at that price point by serving just those tertiary care facilities. So if you now tell them, let's drop the price point to one third, and now for you to meet the same quota and get the same bonus, nothing more, you will have to go to 300 more secondary care facilities or district hospitals. If I'm in, I have been in business for 20 years, I started it, my son is now running it, I would say, no, this is not gonna work. And the commercial team comes back and says, no, this is not gonna work. So as a result, we haven't changed intra-firm incentives on the distribution and commercial side for making tiered pricing work, and that's why the volumes remain small. So we say, well, we did tiered pricing, but the volume never increased. Well, some of it is cascade of care constraints, but some of it is just the wrong incentives. And then we come back and say, because it is not increasing volumes, that means competition is a better way to improve access than tiered pricing. And then this debate, uh, becomes more interesting from an analytical standpoint because we can't answer the question, and Suri's here and she can tell us more because she's looked at this, when do we say that volume expansion through competition is a better lever for improving access versus tiered pricing? And the biggest concern in tiered pricing is the volumes that happen through the lowest tiers remain small. So that's one way of thinking about it. The reason this is important is new products for all types of diseases, including the, the ones that are targeted for low-income countries or the ones which have dual markets, are going to be much more complex to manufacture. So we welcome the program that uh, Gilead has started with voluntary licensing, and I think it has the potential of doing lots of uh, interesting things. But at the same time, some future products will be so complex to manufacture that we won't be able to say there are 15 um, voluntary licensees in India or China who can start manufacturing because even manufacturing capabilities are going to be very technically intensive. And also, the cost of manufacturing will have much more economies of scale. So anyway, so, so these are some things which are emerging. I think the, the, the last thing I'm going to say is, at the interface between global institutions and firms, we can change the risk profile. We can create new types of partnership arrangements, and I think um, many of our global institutions, Global Fund, Gavi, um, PEPFAR, have already started doing that, and I think we need to look at that and highlight that more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prashant. That's a uh, ton, ton of great stuff to chew on there. Um, so I'm going to call Colleen Chen up. Um, when I was in government, I spent a little time working on reforming the patent system. Um, most of what's uh, interesting that I know about the patent system I learned from Terry Fisher. But when I was, um, uh, when I was in, um, sort of thinking about the patent system and the America Invents Act, I started researching you know, who are the people who are writing interesting things about the patent system. And I came across the scholarship 